few different times. Okay, welcome back. Second talk of the morning. Uh, we're happy to have Jeremy Kahn, also from Brown University, who's going to tell us about surface subgroups for non uniform lattices. Okay. So it's a privilege and an honor to be speaking here today. Um, so uh, let me just go ahead and state some theorems. So um, theorem OK, so let uh, Let's put it this way. So let gamma subset of isometries, or minus will make it uh, orientation preserving, let gamma subset of isometries of H3 be co-compact, well, discrete, of course, and co-compact. Um, then and let k be greater than 1 then um, gamma has a k q, well, k quasi Fuchsian um, closed surface uh, subgroup. So it's the representation. We have this uh, H, say, a subgroup of gamma that's K quasi Fuchsian, and H is isomorphic to the fundamental group of a closed surface of some genus. Okay? And I've given many, many, many lectures on this theorem. Um, so let me now state. Be careful. I state the new theorem. Wow. You fight with these boards, they fight back. So uh, the new theorem with Alex says the same. result when uh, gamma, sorry, not f, but gamma is cofinite volume. So our original theorem was for um, uniform lattices and isometries of H3. And the new theorem is for a non-uniform lattice. And so the picture here is that we have the surface SG, and we have our three manifolds. So I used to draw three manifolds just as a square, but this is a three manifold with a cusp. and um, and then we can find, well, given our three manifold with a cusps, cusp, we can find our surface and our function so that this is nearly isometrically immersed. So uh, this is covered by the, um, the circle, by the disk. This is covered by the ball. And we can find a map here. So this will lift to something. Um, that you know the, the limit set here, the image um, of the boundary will well we can make it C0 close to any circle we want, and not only that, but however you blow it up, it'll look nearly like a circle. Because it's a uh, one plus epsilon quasi fuchsian. Okay, so these are the theorems I want to talk about today. I mean, really I want to talk about this, but 
the proof of this theorem really begins with the proof of this theorem. And uh, not everyone in the room has seen a proof of this theorem. And, uh, but before I begin, um, let me maybe uh, ask some questions here. So question one is suppose um, gamma is a subset of some uh, G is a non-uniform lattice in a semi-simple Lie group. So Francois, of course, talked about our work about uniform lattices in certain cases. But suppose we have a non-uniform lattice. Um, so can, can we find a service subgroup? Can we find a closed surface subgroup? And uh, I believe that the answer to this in pretty much all cases should be yes. I mean, there are certain cases where it's obviously false. Like if this is a reducible lattice in, say, S2 R, S2, SL2R cross SL2R, then, or obviously if it's even simpler, if G is SL2R and this is non-uniform, we're not going to find a closed service subgroup. But aside from these examples, so if it's irreducible, for example, I believe it in all cases, if it's um, irreducible and this is not SL2R, I believe we should be able to find a closed service subgroup by methods similar to what I'm going to talk about. But there's a lot of work to do. I mean, the paper with Francois is already close to, it's a long paper. And so this would be another long paper. And the second question, um, I'll just put it here, is um, so, right, uh, can we find a, well, let me put it in quotes, nearly geodesic convex convex, co-compact uh, surface subgroup in the mapping class group, say, for a given G and N. I mean, obviously, again, this should be, um, you know, in the simplest case, like where G is one and n is zero. This is a SL2z, but you know, in, in any of the the hyperbolic surface cases, we can ask this question, or any of the cases of Teichmuller space bigger than one complex dimension, and um, so this is you know, so far as I know, a very open question, and we'd like to have an answer. And this thing is sort of secondary. I mean, we'd be very happy just to get a convex co-compact service group. But uh, I think the question will kind of make more sense as I talk about the construction of the theorem. Essentially, we're going to sort of build these surfaces immersed in the three manifold out of these pants in such a way as to kind of have small bending. And the question is whether we can do something similar. Is there a similar construction that works in the mapping class group? And of course, the idea here is that you have the mapping class group acting on the Teichmuller space and the quotient, so with quotient the moduli space. And uh, if we look at this moduli space, we know it has a cusp, right? We know that it's non-compact. And of course, it's not hyperbolic space. It's not even 
you know, some higher rank locally symmetric space, it's some weird inhomogeneous thing that's much harder to understand and handle than, um, you know, any of these homogeneous examples. But nonetheless, um, this gives us just a little bit more hope. Like the method that we use to deal with cusps here gives us a little bit of hope, a little bit more hope of constructing something, uh, you know, this surf nice surface in, in MGN. Okay, so that's it for the overview. And so, um, let's see, yeah, I want to take maybe 10 or 20 minutes on the proof of this first theorem, and then take the rest of the time on the new ideas in proving the second theorem, where we ha want to build a surface in a manifold with a cusp. All right, so, let's, there are five things to say about this first theorem. And for those of you who've seen it many times, I apologize, but um, we will get back to something new. So um, the first thing here is curves and good curves. So uh, really a curve and well, we could think of it as this M, which of course is this H3 mod gamma. So we can think interchangeably, of course, between the lattice and the quotient manifold. So a curve in here is a is um, well, it's a conjugacy class of gamma for some little gamma and big gamma. So um, it's sometimes I use gamma. I'm going to get into trouble. But let me just use this notation, because I started using it. So it's a conjugacy class of gamma. And it's also, also a closed GD sick and M. All right. And the point is that we can think of gamma as being conjugate in isometries of H3. Well, if we think of H3 as the upper half space, um, then um, we can think of gamma as being conjugate to uh, Z maps to AZ with absolute value of A bigger than, um, bigger than 1. And we can say that the complex length of gamma is equal to log A, which lives in um, C mod uh, 2 pi IZ. Okay, I guess it lives in the positive part of this. But so we have a real length and we have a complex length. So the real length is just going to be the length of this closed curve. So we have gamma, the real length is the length of the closed curve. The complex length is the amount of twisting around it. As we do the parallel transport all the way around, that's the imaginary part. And then the unit normal bundle for gamma, well, it's a proper torsor at least, for um, uh, C mod 2 pi i z plus the length of gamma times z. Okay, so this is some um, torus, and the normal bundle is isomorphic to it. It's a, it's a proper torus, torsor for that. OK, so that's pretty much all there is to say about curves in the manifold, the geometry of a curve. And now we have um, now we have, let's talk about, oh, sorry, one more thing to say here, which I left out. 
So gamma or its conjugacy class, I'll leave it, gamma is good if um, the length of gamma minus r is less than epsilon. So I've gotten slightly ahead of myself here. So we, we want to fix our gamma. We'll fix our m, which is this h3 mod gamma. Right? Of course, this is given to us. And then we fix this k greater than 1. And we get epsilon greater than 0, which we think of as small. It's going to be kind of the error tolerance for our construction. And we're going to get some r uh, that kind of depends on everything else. So r equal r of this m k epsilon that we're going to think of as being large. Okay, So for our good curves, we have this r that's specified at some very large number. And then the length of our curve should be within some small tolerance of this r. OK, so now pants and good pants. Pants and good pants. Um, so what's a pair of pants? Well, we could think of it in two different ways. So a pants is um, in M is a faithful rep, uh, say, pi from A, B, C, such that A, B, C equal 1. This is kind of natural presentation of the pants group to gamma. Again, mod conjugacy in gamma. Um, and uh, so we can think of it geometrically as we have this topological pair of pants, and we have a map into M, uh, some map, I don't know, whatever, F sub pi, um, up to homotopy, up to free homotopy. And we can sort of pull it tight. We can make, can make uh, cuffs and seams. Geodesic. So we can sort of add to this pants seams like this little pass over here, and we can require that the cuffs go to GD6 and M, and that these seams go to GD6 that are orthonormal, you know, that are orthogonal to the cuffs. And the rest is free to sort of flop around. And um, so if we have a pants, we wanted to find the feet of a pant. So if I have a pants here, well, if I have three curves, so I could think of the images here as being, say, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2. If I fix, lift up, say, gamma 0, uh, well, let me say gamma 2 for this picture, then I look at the feet of these orthogeodesics. I mean, really sitting inside of M, there are these little feet, which are these unit normal vectors pointing in the right directions. And so I get some, um, well, I get two of them for every period of gamma 2. It's a little hard to draw with the, the rotation amount. But uh, if I call this, say, a to 0, a to 1, then I get these lifts, a to 0, a to 1, a to 2, and so forth. And um, so what I get is I get a pair of points, um, a to 0, comma, a to 1, sitting inside of uh, this unit normal bundle for gamma. And if I go from here to here, the element that takes me from here to here is going to be half the complex length of gamma. So I can think of this unordered pair as being in um, the square root of the unit normal bundle of gamma, which is a torsor for c mod 2 pi iz plus the half length of gamma 
times z. It's a bit technical, but it's, it's sort of useful. OK, so I have maybe 10 more minutes to finish this part of the argument. All right, so what are we doing? So we've defined, oh, right, and a good pants. So this gives me, this actually defines a half length of gamma. So this is actually wrong here. This should be length of gamma over 2 minus r less than epsilon. And good pants, what we want is just that the half length of each gamma i minus r is less than epsilon. OK, so now we can actually say, I mean, this is just, there's two ways of dividing by 2 over here. There's two possible half lengths. And if the length is sort of close to being real, the half length could be close to being real or close to being real plus i pi over 2. And we just want it to be close to being real. Okay, it's just a technical point. So basically, takeaway is that a, a pants has three boundaries. A pants is good. So this is good pants. Sorry. Good pants. A pants is good if um, all three of its boundary curves are good curves. That's pretty much the takeaway. Pretty much the takeaway. OK, and then the point is that this pants has these feet. So we call this the feet at, say, gamma 2 of our pair of pants, pi. OK, it's kind of a pair of feet here, but you can think of it as a single foot in this kind of quotient. OK, so that is uh, our ingredients for building the surface. We want to build it out of good pants. And now, um, so Katie actually talked about twisting and, and bending. Um, and uh, let's just review this in this context. So if we have two pairs of good pants that are sitting inside of M, so we have one here and then another one maybe looking like this. So we have feet here. We could call this, say, I don't know, pi 0, pi 1. That's, let me just call these pants P and Q. Um, so we have, and then this curve gamma, and we have these feet here. And we also have feet like here and here, the picture gets misleading. But let's just look at this part of it. Uh, so we have, we can take feet at gamma of p minus feet at gamma of q. And this will be an element now, because this is a proper torsor for this, this will be an element of the c mod 2 pi i z plus half length of gamma times z of this quotient torus. So let me just draw it here. Uh, yep. So this looks something like this. So here we have 2 pi i. Here we have half length of gamma, which is nearly real but slightly tilted. And then we get this quotient torus. And this difference always lives in here. OK? And uh, OK, and da, da, da. Um, And it turns out that this is well-defined, basically, if you interchange p and q. Because if you interchange p and q, it's natural to reverse the orientation of gamma. And that kind of cancels out. Like in two dimensions, um, right? if these are like the two feet, then here it says if you look at the right-hand guy, he's sort of tw shifted up with respect to the left. And if you turn this around 180 degrees, you'll get the same picture. So this, this kind of shear distance is well-defined in here. 
And um, so, and we say that we have sort of good, sort of good bending if this feet, if this difference over here, um, so we could call this sort of delta gamma pq, if this minus 1 plus i pi is less than epsilon over r. OK, so this is good bending. Um, so what does this mean geometrically? Well, this i pi, right, like we're rotating around the geodesic. So if we just did i pi, it would be rotating around like this. So if these were geodesic pants, they would fit neatly together. And this one here, it means that one of these guys is kind of sheared by one with respect to another. So if you have one pants here, the other one, well, I, I drew it sort of where the one is down. But it means that this distance here is close to one. OK. And then I'm running out of time here for this first part, but let's continue. We have a sort of local to global theorem. that says that a uh, closed surface, so I should say kind of for all m and k, there exists epsilon and r, um, such that a closed surface in m made of good, and these will actually be oriented pants, with good bending, um, let me just say induces a k quasi-Fuchsian subgroup. All right? So you have the surface, you have the cover associated to the surface, taking the image of the pi 1. And you'll actually get, well, first of all, that the pi 1 will be mapped in injectively. And secondly, that you'll get this k quasi-Fuchsian subgroup, so this nearly Fuchsian subgroup. OK? And well. Time is limited, but just to review, let me draw one picture for this. When you have this twist by one, so if you look at kind of the lift of the surface, it looks something like this. And if you take any unit length transversal, it'll cross it'll cross sort of some constant times r crossings. And each crossing gives you a bending of at most epsilon over r. So you get sort of a small total bending. And this is why it works. Sort of good to keep in mind for what follows. OK, so almost done with this outline. I'm hoping to have maybe 25 minutes left for the new theorem. So now we have equidistribution. So before I talk about this, where, where are we? We've defined good pants and good bending, so a good way of putting them together. And the idea is if we had a surface, if we somehow miraculously had a surface made out of these good pants with good bending, then 
we would actually have a sort of good closed surface in M that would induce this K quasi Fuchsian subgroup. And that would be homotopic to a nearly geodesic one. But we have to build the surface. So, um, right, so the equidistribution theorem says that uh, if we take, so for E, for all uh, gamma in sort of curves in M, sorry, good curves, good curves in M, um, if we look at the set of feet sub gamma of P, where P is a good pants on M and gamma lies in the boundary of P, then this is, well, let me just say exponentially. So in other words, e to the minus qr evenly distributed in the unit normal bundle. Well, as I talked about before, this square root of the unit normal bundle for gamma. So this unit normal bundle looks like this torus. I mean, geometrically, of course, it's all the unit normal vectors, but it's like this. And then in that, we have these feet. And this even distribution, which I have not done justice to, um, is just saying that sort of wherever you look, up to this kind of exponentially small scale, you'll see nearly the same number up to this kind of error. OK. So finally, and let me just say maybe a word about exponential equidistribution, why it's true, and then we're almost finished. So um, yeah, so there is a counting estimate, which gives us this equidistribution. And so the original proof of something like this equidistribution um, use this kind of construction with tripods that Francois talked about, but there's a kind of new way of proving it, uh, which uh, Vladimir Markovich and I actually did for the Aaron Price conjecture case. But we have this counting estimate that works very generally. So it basically says, it's a little hard to write down, but if, for example, I have two GD6, so I have two GD6, sorry, alpha, Ah, dyslexia, alpha and beta. And I'm looking for some region in each. And then I want to count the number of uh, connections. So connections in M. Sorry, that's not the best color. But by connection, I mean like a GD6 segment orthogonal in both places. And say with length in L, L plus some um, delta, then basically it's on the order of, well, if delta is very small, it's just on the order of sort of length of alpha times, so it's proportional to length of alpha times length of beta times e to the L. So it's sort of the number that you'd expect, like because things of radius L grow exponentially in L, except now it's e to the 2L because we're in a 3-manifold. So right, the volume of a ball is, uh, of an R ball is like e to the 2R. So we have this estimate for counting connections, and we can also control the angle at which the connections come out. So even if you specify the angle, there's a kind of similar thing. So there's, you could add in a term theta alpha theta beta or something, which are some intervals over here for the angle for the unit normal vector. And uh, from this kind of counting estimate, it's easy to show this equidistribution. And this counting estimate follows by mixing fairly standard techniques, somewhat new style of estimates. OK, so that's just an aside. What matters is this equidistribution. And um, like every. Beautiful story. Um, 
Ours ends with marriage. So um, what's happening, and also this kind of doubling trick, So we want to make a closed surface. So we look at each, we take all of our good pants, we look at each closed geodesic. Right? So if we take each closed geodesic and we have all of our feet, and so, so sort of for all gamma, there exists this tau from, uh, well, I could say good pants sub gamma of m to itself such that uh, tau, sorry, the, such that the foot at gamma of tau of p minus the foot at gamma at p um, minus pi i plus 1 is less than epsilon over r. So it's saying that there's something, there's a permutation that acts nearly like a translation. And then the idea is that we have this permutation of the set to itself, so we could take two copies of the set and get a sort of matching that induces this permutation. And so we take all of our pants and we give them both orientations. And they're the pants that induce one orientation for gamma. We match them with the pants that induce the other orientation of gamma. And we can match them so that we get always our good bending. And so in that way, we've built our good surface. OK, so that's the proof of the old theorem. We have 20 minutes now. Uh, no, a little bit more by this clock. 22 minutes for the proof of the new theorem, if you've been Sorry, yeah, because we started on that, yeah. So, um, yeah, so we have 22 minutes for the proof of the new theorem. So now, any questions on the proof of the old theorem, the original service subgroup theorem? All right. So, Let's see what we can say here. Should we start a new color? Uh, so now, let's think of this as, well, this guy here as non-compact. OK, so proof of the new theorem. Um, so we should talk about the height of a curve. So before, it just had a complex length. Now it has a height. So we have our three manifold, and maybe it even has more than one cusp. Okay, something like this. And we want to take some sort of, well, I'll call them standard horribles. So what matters really is just, of course, that they're disjoint from each other. Okay, and that'll give us our sort of reference height. And so the height of a curve, um, right, so we can look at kind of, I mean, we could think of gamma as sort of going into these cusps at various times. And it should be pretty clear what this is about. So for each kind of lift of gamma, oops, for each lift of gamma, uh, so that we sort of isolate one of these cusps. We just have a height here, right, to above the standard horrible. So this is our sort of height of gamma. Well, this is our kind of local height. So our height local. And then, of course, our height of gamma is the sort of soup over all entries into the cusp of this local height. Okay, so I think that should be pretty clear. And um, all right, so so
So what's our first step? So before, what we did is we just took all good pants. OK, so a good pants is defined here the same way as we did before. But the problem is that the height of a curve could, in principle, be enormous. Like if you have a curve of length like 2r, right, half length about r, right, its height could be like r. And if you had such a high, high curve, it would fail to have this extra equidistribution of pants around it. Like the whole sort of mixing argument would fail. So what we want to do is fix a cutoff height. This is, um, so I don't know, we could call it HC or something like that. Cutoff height HC. And our first step of our new construction is take all good pants. So we still have this R and epsilon. Take all good pants um, with height of the pants less than this cutoff height. Now, what's the height of a pants? Well, it should be pretty clear. This is just uh, the soup over gamma in the boundary of the pants. It's a soup over a three element set of the height of gamma. OK, so um, this HC, we want to think of this HC as something like 100 log r. That probably works, but we'll, we'll get to it. So it's some constant times log r. And uh, um, so we're just taking all pants that don't go sort of way up into the cusps. OK. And um, so what happens here? So the question is, what happens? Well, what happens to equidistribution? OK, so if we had equidistribution, everything else, like this local to global principle, is just some geometry thing in H3. So all we really need is this equidistribution. So what happens to equidistribution? And the answer The answer is that we can get bald spots. So um, I have to do that. So if we have a, a, a pants, and now the pants, we have this height cutoff, HC, and our pants sort of coming up to that look something like this. If we wanted to sort of look at Pair it with a pants on the other side. So if we were looking for feet of pants on the other side, then um, we could, I mean, the official feet are the feet of these short, short orthogedesics. But it's actually kind of more or less equivalent and more intuitive to work with the feet of these long orthogedesics. And so if we wanted to pair it with something here with good bending, we wouldn't be able to, right? Because our pants would be go going above the cutoff. So we get these bald spots, and that's this problem. OK? But um, we have a safe height, but we get an equidistribution when uh, the height of our curve that we want equidistribution of is less than some safe height which should be something like HC, sorry, it should be something like HC minus maybe 2 log r. Everything in this is kind of multiples of log r. Because if we were below a safe height, then we'd only get some tiny bald spot, basically. And uh, 
the equidistribution really just has to be good up to like epsilon over r. And so it's enough to sort of have some space where the bald spot would be extremely small. Okay, the, the size of the bald spot is kind of exponential in the difference in the heights. Exponentially small. Okay. So here's where we are. We have these pants, and then we have this bald spot. So we have a problem. We have these kind of unmarried pants. And um, what are we going to do with them? So all right, so the basic idea is this thing called the umbrella. So uh, the idea of the umbrella, what is the umbrella? Well, suppose we have this pants. It's a little tricky to draw this kind of stuff. But suppose we have this pants, and I'm trying to draw it a little bit tilted in 3D or something. And now what we want to do, I mean, even if the pants was pointing straight up, we're allowed to do this small amount of bending. And in either case, you know, pointed straight up or slightly bent, we can sort of add something to it. So this is a kind of half plane on the other side that I'm having a hard time drawing. And um, the idea is that this half plane will not go right up into the cusp. It'll be bent slightly away from the cusp. And eventually, it'll have a boundary that's sort of outside of this horrible that we're sitting in. So one sort of picture that's kind of easier to compute with is just something like this. So here's the boundary of our standard horrible. And here's our kind of boundary of our unmatched pants. And uh, we're just trying to sort of fit something in here, or possibly go up a bit and then fit something in. And so here we have some height, which is about our HC, right, our cutoff height. It can't be more than that. And so the area in here, right, area is about, um, well, it's going to turn out to be exponential in h sub c. Right? If you just had, if this has height, if this distance here, hyperbolic distance, is hc, the area under here is going to be like e to the hc. OK. So that's the idea. So what we want to do is build these umbrellas. And um, in the original construction, like when we first thought about it, we built them out of pants. Like we would build the umbrella out of pants. And the whole idea is that we have this one pants, and now we allow pants to go above the height cutoff. But they're sort of following this half plane. And so they go above the height cutoff, and we keep adding pants, adding pants, adding pants, until we sort of get down this whole half. This whole half plane that we matched it with has to get out of the cuff. And so we would just keep adding pants, looking something like this. So here's our first pants, and then the next pants, and so forth. Keep adding pants, 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 until we get out of this horrible. And uh, then, of course, we have to deal with all those boundaries. And this all makes sense, and it 95% works. But we became really concerned with sort of when we create these new pants, so we have to add kind of new connections here, going all the way across. When we create these new pants, we want to really make sure that we're not sort of somehow climbing into a new cusp. That's the first thing. So um, let me just say this. So problems with the pants umbrella. So first of all, can we accidentally climb into a new cusp? And secondly, I mean, there are ways to deal with it, but uh, multiple excursions. So our unmatched pants could have sort of multiple excursions. 
into cusps. Okay, maybe I should draw pictures of this, pictures worth a thousand words, but so we could have a curve that kind of went many times into cusps in separate places, and we'd have to sort of build this whole umbrella sort of dealing with all of these at the same time. So we decided to make a sort of new tool um, to build our umbrella with, And this is known as a hamster wheel. So it, uh, it's a modification of an earlier construction by uh, Vladimir Markovich and Saul Schleimer, I think, that was known as a wheel. But it's slightly easier to work with. So a hamster wheel, um, well, probably the best schematic looks like this. Dot, 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 dot. OK, so how do you construct it? So you start with like two closed geodesics. So we have two good curves. And then it's easiest to assume r is an integer. So we just mark off on both sides here at every unit length. Um, well, we mark off two r of these guys. So this is approximately unit length. And then we find these connections. And these connections have length close to r. It's not exactly r. What matters is that when you then form these closed geodesics, that these are now good curves. So that's the basic idea of the hamster wheel. We, we're taking two good curves, and we're finding two r good connections to make another 2R good boundary curves. So the hamster wheel, it's sort of this region here, and then it has these 2R plus 2 uh, boundary curves. And so the point is, uh, this is not easy. Stay, stay, stay. Gentle. So the point is that we can now make our hamster wheel umbrella. So what does it look like? I mean, it's, it's very similar to this. So um, our sort of schematic picture here is we have this and this. Like, here's our boundary again, so boundary of unmatched pants. Um, and then we add to this our first hamster wheel, which looks, our boundaries look something like this. This is some very schematic picture now. And then we add the next layer when necessary. And sometimes, of course, if we go down far enough, we don't need anything more. It's only in this kind of region until we get out of the cusp that we keep adding these hamster wheels. Okay, and one nice thing about the hamster wheel um, is, so if this is the kind of the old boundary of the hamster wheel, and these are our new boundaries, sorry, our new boundaries, then this distance here, well, it's some constant, so it's about one. I don't know, maybe it's a half, or pi over two. It doesn't matter. Like, instead of having these cuffs of the pants being exponentially close together, we have all of this space. And because we have all this space, we can actually have a bending of epsilon rather than epsilon over r when we have this space. So the whole idea is that we, we add on this hamster wheel, and then we add on more hamster wheels and more hamster wheels, and we're just always bending by epsilon in the same direction. So the first bend by epsilon really just ensures us that we're only going to go a bounded amount higher than we started. And all the subsequent bendings say that we're going to sort of stay under the half plane that was kind of indicated by the first one. 
And because we're adding all of these guys, all these spokes kind of independently, it's very easy for these guys to avoid going high into the cusp. And uh, again, because we're adding them independently, it's really not a problem to deal with multiple excursions into the cusp. So uh, that's our hamster wheel umbrella. And uh, so our height, so the height of the umbrella is at most the height of the curve plus a constant. And the sort of area or volume or number of umbrellas that we use, number of hamster wheels, so it's the number of hamster wheels, is again less than e, well, a constant times e to the height of gamma. Actually, I'm lying. It's e to the height of gamma times 1 plus uh, delta, delta going to 0 as like epsilon goes to 0. So slight issue here, because we use actually the k quasi-conformality to estimate this area. OK, so in five more minutes, I think we can finish this. Um, well, I can just start here. So what have we done? We've taken our unmatched pants, and we've added these hamster wheel umbrellas. So the unmatched pants, they're kind of sticking up to the cutoff. We add these hamster wheel umbrellas, and we're bringing the hamster wheel umbrellas like all the way down, like outside. Well, we can't right bring it down to height 0, but we can bring it down to height like 2 log r or 4 log r. And uh, so we're bringing it way, way down below the cutoff height, which is like 100 log r. And, but this hamster wheel umbrella, like each hamster wheel, of course, has like our boundary components, two our new boundary components. And we keep adding things more and more and more. So we get this number of new boundary components. OK, so for each curve that we're correcting in this way, for each curve that we're matching, we're getting this number of new boundary components. And we somehow have to deal with all these new boundaries. Okay, all of those have to be matched up still. So what do we do? We make a very simple estimate. So the size of the problem All right, so the sort of total new total new boundary of this hamster wheel umbrellas Um, is controlled by, so it's on the order of, uh, so e to the h of gamma, well, um, times number of unmatched curves, well, number of unmatched pants. Right? Well, e to the h of gamma times 1 plus delta. But it'll turn out not to matter. And what is this? Well, it turns out that this is equal to e to the minus 2 h of gamma times total number of pants. OK. And why do we have minus 2 h of gamma? Well, it's basically because the volume of the cusp at height h is like e to the minus 2h, because we're in three dimensions. If we were in two dimensions, this would fail. OK, but because we're in three dimensions, we get an e to the minus 2h of gamma here. Sorry. So we're taking, I said h of gamma here, but really I should say this cutoff height, right? All of the curves that we're dealing with are less than this cutoff height. And the whole point here is that the number of curves or pants, the proportion of curves or pants that reach this cutoff height is like e to the minus 2hc. And so the size of the problem, well, it's just this very simple multiplication, right? So it's equal to e to the, um, well, minus 1 plus delta 
times HC times number of good pants. Um, well, OK. So the, the point is that if we make this HC, I'm almost out of time here, but if we make this HC large enough, then what we've done is we've said that the size of the sort of new stuff that we're getting is very small compared to the size of the old stuff. So it's kind of a small perturbation of our original situation where we had equidistribution. So I'm not going to write anymore because I'm out of time. But you'd think we're finished. But we have to say one word more, which is when we start with these unmatched pants, I guess I've erased that. When we have these unmatched pants, whether or not they're unmatched depends on their orientation. Right? We have to sort of pair them up by twisting by one. So the unmatched pants are actually oriented unmatched pants. And as a result, everything else, these hamster wheels have to be oriented. The hamster wheel umbrellas are oriented. The problem that we have is with new oriented pants. But the number of pants that induce the two orientations of gamma has to exactly match up. It's like the situation in the Aaron Price conjecture. And so we've introduced a small error, but we've introduced an error we cannot sort of immediately ignore. So the answer, of course, for those who've seen me talk about the Aaron Price conjecture, is that we have a way of correcting this error with the good pants homology. I'm not going to write anymore, but we have a way of correcting this error with the good pants homology. We just apply this theory in three rather than two dimensions. And as a result, we can sort of make it so that there's exactly, we can apply a small correction, a uh, small sign correction to the number of pants we take so that there's exactly the same number inducing each orientation at each curve. And then we can pair it off. And all we need to do that is just to say that this is kind of like polynomially or super polynomially small in R. And we can do that just by taking height sort of a large multiple of log R. And so that's how we can construct our surface. We can make our closed surface. And we have a similar local to global principle when we throw in these hamster wheels. And so we get it nearly geodesic. Thank you. Yes, so um, for the service subgroup case, uh, right, if you want sort of 1 plus epsilon quasi Fuchsian, it should be enough to use kind of polynomial in 1 over epsilon pants, because the rate of mixing is exponential, and the growth of pants is both, both of these are exponential in R. And there should be something similar in the cusp case, basically. I don't think it's any different. Yes, we can. So I should have mentioned the cooper footer results. So before our theorem about nearly GD6 surfaces in the cusp hyperbolic theorem three manifolds, there's the recent cooper footer result that gets quasi Fuchsian ones, but they can get them between any two planes. And yes, we can definitely get them between any two planes, just as we do in the original closed manifold case. <laughs> 